So I want to talk a little about um, dispensationalism and uh, the thing about isms is that we never want to fit everything we know into an ism and discard everything that doesn't fit into the ism. Once the ism becomes your governing principle to the point where you're more zealous for that than anything, you're going to be led into extremes and you're going to be led into camps, divisive camps, camps that not everybody can fit in. And this kind of goes along with my divisiveness and fellowship, you know, like I've, can you read Luther? Can you read Bunyan? Can you read Martin Lloyd-Jones? Jones, I brought him up. He's a Presbyterian which meant he was amillennial probably and reformed in his perspective by Calvinist leanings and yet one of the best uh, preachers of grace that I've heard in a long time. Uh, he died a while ago and he wrote a book called Causes of Spiritual Depression and just brought me to the cross and it was so good. He was a cross-centered, Christ-centered Christian and this is what you should look for. Because we are all over the map on a lot of these things. And here's the problem. Each of us thinks we've got the key of David. So, you know, we are, not everybody, but we, we come up with a system of interpretation that becomes the way we see everything. And you know, you can know when you're starting to get off. When you become zealous for something other than Christ. That is really something else. And it's very intoxicating. And see, the enemy, remember, he's an enchanter. That's his, the uh, word for, the Hebrew word for the shining one. Literally meant enchanter. He's able to make something look so beautiful to draw you away from the tree of life and bring you into something else that looks very beautiful and very spiritual. But it will ultimately bring you into a place where you're, in Christian terms, isolated and not just because Christianity you don't fit in anymore because you're a grace believer and you love Jesus. But you can't fit in with anybody because you're standing on the little tiny, little tiny, teeny tiny platform that your ism formed. And there's about seven of you. <laughs> and uh, you don't like each other that much, but as long as you all say the right words that belong to your ism, you've got to include each other and exclude everybody else. Now that's the extreme. Along the way, you, you didn't mean to go there. I, I think in most cases people didn't mean to go there. It just comes from taking your ism and following it to its logical extremes. The ism seems to imply this, and then that thing that it implied you accept, and then you take that and you go, well, that seems to imply this. And then you accept that. And now you're two or three steps into a web of implications that only someone who's deep into your ism would even understand how if they were to pluck one of those implications they'd tear the whole web down and leave you with nothing and that's why you're so defensive about it right and I'm talking to myself too uh, I've been there in many different forms and Jesus saves us from these things these are these are little prisons we build for ourselves. Um, but they're built because we are fascinated with something that we think is good and right and spiritual. And when it comes to dispensationalism, I am a dispensationalist. And I talk quite a bit about rightly dividing the word of truth. And I definitely, I believe dispensationalism but really is about the distinction that... Paul made about his ministry between 
the truths that he was commissioned to reveal and everything that went before. Um, Pauline dispensationalism. He becomes the interpretive... Uh, his writings become the interpretive lens through which we see the rest of Scripture. That's all that really means. Um, hold on. Now, okay, continuing that thought. Um, so, okay, dispensationalism. I am not discounting dispensationalism. Um, when I discovered... See, I was brought... I was brought to the Lord through dispensational teaching about the millennium. That's what made me realize there's a literal kingdom and that world history is coming to a climax. Um, that's my testimony. And then I got saved reading Wolverd. But then I went on this long journey away and back because even though I learned that Israel is distinct from the church, I only learned it in the light of of it only penetrated me in the light of the church has a heavenly destiny to be conformed to the image of Christ glorified with him and manifested as the sons of God and will reign with Christ as these resurrected king priests during the millennium shining with his glory and then Israel has a destiny to be almost like the church is now during the millennium on the earth inheriting their earthly kingdom and being born of the spirit but then to tell you the truth i'm not 100 percent sure that born of the spirit is accurate they'll have the spirit he'll put a new spirit in their heart and he'll put a new spirit within them and his spirit within them write his law in their heart give them a new heart and sprinkle them it'll be under grace but i think that they're not members of the body of christ there is a special inheritance with Christ for the bride, for the body of Christ, that is different. I'll hold to that at least, I think. Now, um, but I didn't understand the implications of law grace distinctions that were not under Moses. You know, if I'd have known that, I would have really avoided some suffering, I think. And yet, we have to learn these things the hard way. There's no quick, you can't just go to school read a book, and come out and be ready to live the Christian life. You have to be shaped, and through experiences, the word has to become hammered into you, and you've got to be formed in the potter's house like clay, you know, and the Father has to bring you through many different things that will bewilder you while you're going through them, and you won't understand until you come out that he was teaching you this thing so that he could teach you that thing, and once you taught you that, now he can show you this. I mean, it's like God knows what he's doing, you know, and it's funny, like you could probably tell your testimony as a sequence of the books you read and in the order that you read them. And I used to do that. I used to try to think, OK, what were the most profound books I read and where did they take me? And it is amazing because God was behind that, you know, for me. But anyway. It really wasn't until about seven years ago that I came back to dispensational truth in terms of law and grace paradigm. And I didn't really know that the brethren were raised up primarily in reaction to reformed theology, which was the lordship of the day, you know. Protestantism had become completely Galatianized and were living under the law as a rule of life. And all the commentaries produced by the main evangelical Protestant figures, the churchmen were, and the Puritans, you know, were of that thread because they didn't distinguish between Israel and the church and they allegorized everything related to Israel and believed that the church was now just Israel. And so they put us under Moses. And I mean, they were, it was awful. And so the, the, the brethren were raised up. Their primary burden was actually to bring the word of grace and Pauline distinctions back. And so their motive in separating the church and, and Israel was not to become prophecy hobbyists. See, everybody talks about Nelson, John Nelson Darby as if he was some kind of prophecy hobbyist and was writing left behind literature. No, 
he was a grace preacher. If you go back and read the brethren and really read what they were talking about, their main burden was to set everything in its proper place so that the church could emerge as this free uh, organ heavenly organism that was free from all earthly trappings because they saw the glory in of the ascended Christ shining through Paul's ministry. And they realized that there was a distinction between Israel, the church, and the Gentiles. And then they took the prophecies and everything, literally, they restored a literal interpretation of the Bible. And yes, there's much more spoken about the rapture and the prophecies and everything from the brethren than even in early church history, although we see all that stuff in church history, because they had the leisure. For the first time, they had the education, the background, and the leisure because they're living in a time of peace, to explore, quote, the minutia, you know, really get into the word and open it up. And we really haven't improved on the brethren since, I mean, you know, yes, there's an explosion of light to the average person. There's guys like me getting on YouTube and saying things, you know, but, and and we see some, some nuances but we are standing, if uh, if you are in the prophetic community at all, you are standing on the shoulders of the brethren. And I hope that you've read John Nelson Darby, H.A. Ironside, Lewis Ferry Schaefer, Miles Stanford. You know, you don't have to agree with everything they said, but these guys were uh, great gifts to the body of Christ. And I don't know of anyone that matches that um, today in terms of the sobriety with which they approached the word and the godliness, the godly character that accompanied their pursuit of the truth and their testimony of the grace of God. Usually, you know, grace people, we've got a loosey-goosey background. That's why we're grace people, because we know we can't make it, you know. But these guys were proper English gentlemen on top of it all. And uh, they had a character and a discipline. And I don't want to uh, put them up on pedestals or something like that, but I'm just telling you there, there's a difference. And, you, and I think you know what I'm talking about if you've ever read uh, any of this stuff. So, okay. Now, fast forward to my life <laughs> today. And I got back into dispensationalism as and, and started really seeing, oh, because why? Because I went to a... Um, through a Chinese group that believed that we'd be in the outer darkness. They tried to fuse Paul's ministry with Jesus' ministry. So they, while they talked about the ministry of grace better than anybody, I mean, they, they were so good at preaching from Ephesians and Colossians and Romans and Hebrew, I, you know, oh my, the riches of Christ. But the secret snare was that they tried to fuse that with the kingdom of the heavens for Israel. And they took Paul's ministry and said, if you are not partaking of what Paul describes related to the building up of the body of Christ and are not exercising to build with gold, um, silver, and precious stones and are not part of the church life as we see it in the New Testament, if you're not part of this recovery is what they called it of the truth and practice for the building up of the body of Christ to become the new Jerusalem. Then they would go back to Matthew 25 and say, that means that you are a foolish virgin. And that means that you are, uh, you probably buried your talent and you will be in the outer darkness during the millennium. And they said that the rewards to the churches in revelation were for the millennium, which is true. And that is the inheritance for the believers. And you can lose your inheritance like Esau and not enter the kingdom. And now at the time it was a very, and, and yes, you're saved and you'll go into the new Jerusalem, but you'll be disciplined for a thousand years in outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, um, and this came from a literal reading of the scriptures and literally taking what Jesus said and applying it in a way that it, in a way it should be applied 
you should take it that literally. You should take it that seriously, and it should cause you to stumble and go, okay, what is this? But that's where it wasn't until I got back to the dispensational ground that I realized we were mixing church truth with church the truth that was intended for the kingdom and for the for israel okay and at that time it was a very small group of people that believed this stuff and i had no one to talk to about it but then i started seeing it leak out and i saw some of my favorite teachers that see i'd stopped listening to every christian teacher once i discovered this group because we had the high peak of the divine revelation and why would you go back to anything less and so when I came out, I hadn't listened to other people in seven or eight or nine years. And I discovered that this true, this mixture was getting out into some of my f most, the most respected teachers I had known before I went into the group. And this to me was tragic. So that plus going to a reformed church led me back to the dispensational ground. But I went, as I was reading dispensationalists, trying to find people today who were dispensationalists, I found some that went to the extreme, okay? And um, this is what I want to get at without getting into a debate. I'm not offering a debate. I'm offering a word of encouragement and kind of a warning, but, you know, any ism can become an obsession, and to where you only see that thing and now you're going to go in that direction as far as you can. Even if it takes you away from Christ himself, you know. Now, dispensationalists are, for the most part, grace believers. But, you know, we only have one church in my city that's called a dispens that even associates with dispensational truth out of the hundreds of churches. And I looked at their website and discovered that that pastor was an authoritarian. And on his website... He says, we do not believe in the gifts of the Spirit. You will not practice them here, and you will not come to my church unless you agree to absolute obedience to the pastor and everything. <laughs> Where is he getting that, you know? So, I am a dispensationalist, but I'm not a cessationalist. I do believe that the gifts are for the kingdom. They are for the millennium, ultimately. But there are privilege, too. And we kind of, there's some crossover and some mixing and bleed between some of these distinctions. And if you get too hard about it, you lose out on blessings. And this is really where I want to warn you because, and I'm not advocating charismatic Christianity or pursuit of the gifts of the spirit or anything like that. I'm saying pursue the face of Jesus Christ and make sure that he is your governing principle and don't hold an ism higher than Christ. And don't hold an ism and insist on your ism to the point where you're willing to break fellowship over it. Now, if you find a Galatianizing Judaizer who's insisting that you're under the law, then yeah, you can't fellowship. That's a salvation issue. But if you find someone, if you're a cessationalist and you believe, and you see someone who's practicing the gifts of the Spirit, you know, and it, it's hard because these people don't believe that that stuff is for today. So they think every manifestation of it's false. And that's really sad. You know, when I got saved, um, I didn't know any better. And I laid hands on the sick and saw them recover. And my, the most dramatic was I told my friend, this is the operation of the word of the knowledge. My best friend at the time who had led to the Lord stuttered. He could barely get a sentence out. And I told him, I just found myself saying, your word was, your mouth was framed for the word of God. Go home and read the book of John out loud and you'll never stutter again. And I said it with boldness, and afterwards I was like, what did I just do? Sure enough, he did, and he didn't stutter ever again. That was an operation of the word of knowledge. And in fact, when I speak uh, on these YouTube channel, a lot of times it's out of a gift. I don't know if it's a word of wisdom or of a, what a teaching gift, or but I know that there is a clarity that's not in my daily life, that I'm not this eloquent blah, blah, blah guy. Um, but once I turn that camera on and start functioning and exercise my spirit a little bit, truth comes pouring out truth that I haven't even considered before. And that is not for me. That is for the body of Christ. It's not for me. It's not for me to be, who are we be? It's a, a gift to the body of Christ. Okay. Well, if you are a f strict dispensationalist that says that the gifts ceased, 
Well, what about the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge and all the things that operate by the Holy Spirit to give you utterance? And you see, a lot of times you listen to these guys and they're dry, 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 because it's an academic, it's an academic endeavor. They are following a line of logical thought. Now, I've said this before, but the thing to look for is does someone just repeat other people? That is kind of like a telltale that you're in one of these little clubs because you are speaking a language that is borrowed from other people. You haven't seen any light in the word lately. And I'm talking to myself. I've been there. You get to a point where you're reading the book of this guy and that guy and that guy and this guy and listening to this teacher and that teacher and this teacher and you can eloquently quote everything they say. And yet when you get into the word, you see nothing. You never come out with a new nourishing thing. The Holy Spirit doesn't give you anything while you're in the word because that ism, even if it's correct, has become a veil to you. So that you think that you're going after something spiritual, but it's not Christ. You become zealous for something other than Christ. You're pursuing it rather than Christ, and it's leading you into a kind of fuzzy darkness, a grayness at least. And your joy isn't there. And that's another key. And you're angry at everybody who doesn't agree the way you agree. Now, I appreciate compliments that I am rightly dividing the word, but I'm not dispensationalist to the extreme that I would say that the gifts of the Spirit are for today and aren't for today. And I also am not one of these guys that's cut up my Bible so that I've only got Romans through Philemon. And I say that James and Hebrews and Revelation are entirely for the tribulation. Now, I'm not saying that that's a divisive thought to hold. But I'm, what I will say is that you won't arrive at that just from your study of the scripture. You've heard someone teach that, okay? That is a school of thought. They call it hyper-dispensationalism. I would just say be careful and tell the Lord, please keep me looking at your face and keep your light shining on me. Keep me in under the light. Keep me in your mercy. Keep me focused on you, soft-hearted towards you. Give me your spirit, Lord. Give me eyes to see. Give me true understanding. Give me wisdom. Give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation and fill me with the full knowledge of your will. Don't let me be sidetracked in somebody else's flock that, uh, like, you know, like I said in that one message about Song of Songs, she said, why, uh, shepherd, where do you make your flock lie down? Why must I be like one who is veiled and turned aside from you in the flocks of your companions. These people are God's friends. They love God. They do. But they're on, they're, they're pursuing a line of truth that has, is getting people in the weeds. And if you pursue that line of thought more than you pursue the Lord, you'll get in the weeds, even if the line of thought is right. Okay. Dispensationalism is good if it brings you to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But if it rightly divides you to the point where you don't have fellowship with every, anybody and your Bible is only a few books and you can't get any life out of anything else anymore, you are cutting yourself off from the flow. And I'm saying this lovingly. And I, there's only a few people that I think I'm talking to. And I'm, and if you think it's you, I'm probably not talking to you. Um, I've not seen anybody on my channel lift a divisive finger about this issue at all. I've heard people say, hey, I really appreciate you rightly dividing the word. That's right on, man. But a couple people did question, you know, well, I think these books are for the tribulation. That's fine if you believe that. But what I'm saying is it that's you won't find that in the scripture. Um, now, my personal belief is that people in the tribulation are going to be on the run and they're not going to have time to sit down and read through Hebrews and suddenly and, and spend the years that it takes to understand the truths in Hebrews so that you can distinguish between the old system under Moses and the new system under Christ. Some people think that's a tribulation book because... There will be the temple again, and there will be need to discern, you know. But the thing is, is that the Jews today have not been steeped in temple tradition 
So they don't need to be, um, they haven't been brainwashed to think that that's the end all be all the way it was in the first century. And that is a first century book that was relevant to Christians who were Jewish in their tradition and background and were vacillating between the old and the new in the, uh, in Jerusalem up the, in the upcoming days, the, deception is you know when the antichrist walks into the temple there's not going to be a need to sit down and read hebrews to understand that this guy is from satan you know and we need to run the jews will know what to do they don't need to read through hebrews they're going to have the two witnesses and they're going to have the 144,000. and the thing about that too is hebrews is such a blessed book without hebrews you don't have the revelation of the high priestly ministry of Christ. And I've gotten so much good truth out of our relationship to him as our surety and as the one who is uh, the captain and the forerunner who's bringing us many sons into glory. He's bringing many sons into glory in Hebrews, right? Well, that's his role for the church. That's a church book. He brings us into the Holy of Holies and is ultimately going to glorify us. And he partook of flesh and blood because we are partakers of flesh and blood. And he's become like us so that we might become like him. And he's bringing many sons to glory and he's presenting them to the father as a trophy of his work and saying, look, I and the children that you've given me. And he's proclaiming his, our, his, uh, the father's praises from the midst of the congregation meaning literally in his body and he's our surety you know there's so much in there that is for us that it's really unfortunate if you relegate hebrews to the tribulation um james there's another there's a whole story behind james that you know that would take another video but um that was a first century book there's some holy spirit in it but there's a veil there and Christ is not clearly seen in it. And Luther said it doesn't have much Pauline truth in it. So he didn't even put it in his canon. But I think it needs to be in there with the understanding that it was written before Acts 15. And it's devoid of certain understandings. And and the Holy Spirit still used it and, and inspired it even. And um, there's not going to be congregations during the tribulation that have the kind of order that you see in the church that James was talking to, that it's going to be a time of chaos. You're not going to see lampstands. Um, believers are going to go, it's, it's going to be a different thing. So you're not going to see the need for an admonition about how, to, you know, it's just the admonitions in James speaking to an orderly congregation in a peaceful time, but it's first century. Um, now, peaceful, there's still persecutions in James and stuff. And I, I don't want to go into a big debate about this. Um, this is just what I'm seeing from the, when I see the word, you know. Yes, I rightly divide, but I don't cut the scripture up to the point where I say, only this is for you. You just have to be careful. Because you. I don't want to undermine the point of dispensationalism. That, yeah, we see everything through the lens of Paul. But I'm telling you, you can go so far that you cut yourself off and you cut out the foundation from underneath you and you're standing on this little platform where everybody in it is just going to be beating each other, and beating everybody else and saying, you're not rightly dividing, rightly dividing, rightly. If you, you know, if I find someone who says rightly dividing 20 times in 10 minutes, I suspect that they might be in a club because <laughs> Paul only said rightly dividing once. And not only that, but he used the word cut straight. Really, it means to cut straight. But we can say rightly dividing because it means properly unfolding in its context, right? So, um, but some of these hype, some of these guys have gone so far that they're dividing themselves from everything and dividing the scriptures up. And, you know, and I'm not accusing of anything of heresy or nothing like that. What I'm saying is be careful and stand with the Lord and make sure that you're not in an ism, but you're in the Lord's grace. I better shut up now. Please don't fill my wall with a bunch of debates about rightly dividing the word. Please. I, I probably opened a door, Pandora's box here. I hope I didn't. Hope you understand what I'm saying. And pray that you be kept in the truth and in the mercy of the Lord. This is an admonition I felt led to give for some reason. 
And like I said, I haven't seen anybody on my channel like this. And don't think that just because you told me, hey, good good job rightly dividing the word, that I'm talking to you. And don't think that you, if you mentioned that some of these letters are for the tribulation, that I'm talking to you. I'm not. We, you know, we are so, we are groping and searching out these truths, you know, and it's okay to explore this stuff. What I'm saying is don't be dogmatic to the point where and zealous to the point where this thing, this uh, di rightly dividing, for example, becomes your fascination and your rightly dividing becomes your Lord and not Jesus Christ. Because it can happen. And I'm telling you from personal experience, I know what it's like and it's not fun. All right. God bless you guys.